delighted to be here for <clears throat> sound work. And I'd like to start off uh, with a quotation uh, a few years old now from 2011 by um, poet and conceptual writer Kent Goldsmith, um, writing about the state of poetry then um, in relation to the internet. He says, clearly this is setting the stage for a literary revolution. Or is it, from the looks of it, most writing proceeds as if the internet had never happened? Of course, that might be slightly less true now in 2016, and slightly less true of music, but I think it's still a question worth asking about much of the experimental music community. Um, Goldsmith, uh, that was from his book, Uncreative Writing, where he outlines a theory of digital text, digital poetry, uh, in the 20th and early 21st centuries. He points out familiar, um, familiar argument of uh, photography creating a revolution in the visual arts at the turn of the 20th century. Um, Goldsmith's argument is that in writing, that was actually not the case. The typewriter, um, although a new technology at the beginning of the 20th century, for him did not revolutionize the way that writers approached text, especially notions of the copy, um, reproduction, etc. For him, that moment came with digital text, um, with the computers, with the web, where writers could suddenly copy and paste. We discussed those terms quite a bit already in this. Uh, this, this conference. Um, and he refers to the, uh, the outcome of this, um, his term is uncreative writing. He cites Marjorie Perloff, uh, uh, another theorist of digital text who refers to moving <coughs> information, the idea that for recent writers, what you do with information, where you find it, how you move it around is more important than any notion of originality or uh, more traditional creativity. Um, and I'd like to argue that Sound has a little bit of a different trajectory in the 20th and early 21st centuries. Um, there was, of course, uh, an important change in reproduction. Um, we all know Walter Benjamin's essay um, referring to the reproduction of recorded sound. Um, however, and despite the wonderful um, keynote we heard yesterday, in some ways I think that the revolution of digital sound has been overstated. Um, many of the digital tools that we use as composers are modeled on analog tools, if we think of the timeline of a DAW, for example. Um, but uh, the web, of course, did allow, um, and, and digital text did allow, a certain degree of new things that we could do with sound. But a lot of these are kind of um, grafting the revolution of digital text onto sound. We can search for sounds uh, using textual metadata. Um, we can organize enormous databases in iTunes and find things by their titles or by their authors. But is that really such an important change? Um, I'd like to argue that actually an even bigger change has come more recently, which is, uh, let's call it the revolution of music information retrieval. Basically, the last 15 years or so, um, we actually have the technology to search audio. And that's fundamentally different from searching audio by textual metadata. Um, so for, for those who are less familiar with music information retrieval, it's the uh, group of practices um, developing around audio descriptors and audio features, um, parameters that can be analyzed in an audio sound or attributed to an audio uh, document that can then be used for all sorts of operations, including searching. And MIR is behind a lot of consumption of music that you may knowingly or unknowingly be doing, um, whether it's through Spotify, who who uses sophisticated MIR algorithms for uh, some of its classification and genre identification, for example. Um, there's a growing list of tools, um, both uh, behind the scenes and openly available. Um, many of these tools are free or open access. Um, it's growing all the time. Um, so you might recognize some familiar software there. You might not know some other software. Um, toward the bottom, you'll see uh, one important moment in the field of MIR was when Spotify acquired a company called Echo Nest, which was one of the most uh, sophisticated research groups in MIR. And that, that was in 2014, and that seemed to represent a move by the music industry uh, toward identifying MIR as an important tool for marketing. Um, so what does this mean for creativity? Um, in my abstract, I quoted Nicolas Donat, who says that composition now includes as well the navigation between different reproducibilities through operations of translation, such as transcription, transcoding, or transformations. Um, reproduction, 
I'd like to propose is fundamentally related to research. Um, as audio reproducers, um, we're engaged in a practice of information gathering, like Goldsmith mentioned in terms of uncreative writing or, or perhaps moving information. A lot of my process of creation, and I think many of the composers and musicians around me, has more to do with moving bits of audio around than with generating any supposedly original audio. Um, and this leads to, we've heard already this weekend, some really interesting proposals for different distributed processes of creativity. Um, and these come to resemble research collaborations in other fields, perhaps. Um, when a composer is working with other media artists, performers, stage directors, software developers, um, that uh, to me is at the beginning to be a very healthy opportunity for collaboration in, in our field. Um, Jennifer Walsh has referred to some of these trends as the new discipline. Um, she's, she's referring to a slightly different constellation of uh, artists and practices, but um, there is an overlap, I think, with what, what I'm describing, the fact that, uh, as Odette gave us, a, uh, was it Sibelius at the beginning of his talk, the composer alone in his room with a uh, score and cat is, is no longer the model that a lot of us are, are interested in. Um, so first I'd like to do a very rapid tour of a few composers and sound artists who I think are either directly using MIR technologies or in a way are inspired by the pre their presence in our culture. Um, one is Peter Alminger, who I'm sure many of you know his Voices in Piano, an ongoing uh, collection of works, or we could perhaps call it a single work, um, that can never be performed in its entirety or is never intended to be performed in its entirety. It's begun in 1998. He continues to add pieces, and each piece is based on an archival recording of a well-known figure. Um, I'll play just a few. Apologies, all of the musical excerpts will be very, very short, uh, given the short talk, but I hope you'll be able to go and find uh, longer audio on your own later. <laughs> So very much a process of assembly, collage, information gathering, um, found objects. Another artist who very directly is involved in MIR is uh, composer Maximilian Markel. Um, what you're looking at there is what he calls a material network. Um, using self-programmed software, uh, he ascribes uh, different kinds of metadata as well as audio data to databases of sound that he collects and constructs networks associating these sounds um, into diagrams like the one you see here, and then uses them as pre-compositional plans for his pieces, which then include MIR transcriptions of the audio for live instruments. Um, he's developed software called Quince that you may know. It's free, a very powerful <coughs> MIR software. Um, so here's an example of Marco, who also has become an instrument builder. Again, the different uh, changing roles of the creator to make this kind of work. So you'll see him on a self-made instrument performing himself uh, the beginning of his compound number five construction adjustment. The titles are drawn from the material network, so we'll hear something with construction, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you. 
examples that I wanted to refer to is Jennifer Walsh. Um, I mentioned her uh, um, rubric, The New Discipline, earlier. Um, she's, uh, I like this quotation from the program notes for um, the total uh, mountain, which I'm about to play a short excerpt from, um, that uh, artists figure out a way to smuggle more of what the artist thinks is reality into the work of art. Um, so she does that in a very different way from Abling or Marco. Um, there isn't MIR in the sense of audio search, but there is certainly a lot of work with the internet as an archive and using that data as part of her work. So this is an excerpt from the <coughs> Jordan Mountain for Voice and Film. She also brings in lots of other um, web audio. The piece, that was the piece that personally taught me about the phenomenon of ASMR, which I've never been the same since. Um, and she's also uh, interested in gathering some other work that uh, people are doing using the internet. Um, so you can actually go to her website and submit examples of post, what she calls post-internet sound. I'll be curious to see what she and Holly Herndon come up with um, through this study. So how does this apply to what I do as a composer? Um, uh, I'm interested in, uh, I, I call my practice sometimes music instrumental concrète, a sort of play on words of Helmut Lachenmann. I'm interested in extended instrument resources, some of the things that uh, Giovanni Zerando mentioned yesterday. Um, but unlike Lachenmann, I'm especially interested in how they could uh, be subjective of reference points beyond the instrument on stage um, and perhaps concrete sounds uh, from other sources. Um, I'm interested in work that's radically personalized to the performer. Um, so most of my pieces begin by meeting with the performer and recording a large sample bank, which then will include every sound that's played in the work. So um, one could joke that the pieces are actually performed before they're composed. Um, the performer contributes all of the sound before I set anything to paper. Um, I use... Uh, interactive um, electronics, but also, um, very important to me, uh, analog electronics, including close amplification of instruments to allow a kind of reduced listening in the Schaeferian sense, which, as I mentioned, with regard to Lachenmann, would allow those sounds perhaps to have a life beyond their identity and the instrumental cause and suggest other sonic realities. Um, and just as a side note, uh, isn't MIR in a way the sort of mythical epoche of Schaefer? A computer can listen in a completely reduced way, unlike a human. A computer doesn't know what the cause of a sound is. Um, so, how I do this technically, um, I use uh, intensively a package from Max MSP developed by Dimo Schwartz and his collaborators at IRCOM um, called CatArt. Uh, you're looking at a slightly older version of of CatArt, it now is part of a library called Muvu, um, multi-buffer. But the concept is the same. Um, you can analyze a database of your own audio, um, or, or any audio. Um, it can accept a fairly large database, and then it uh, splices those sounds into short units and analyzes them for different descriptor values, both uh, ones that you might expect, like pitch or level, other um, spectral measures like spectral centroid, spectral flatness, periodicity, um, or you could uh, add your own analyses as well. Um, and then it allows you to navigate those sounds through a multi-dimensional interface. So here you're looking at a, a two-dimensional map of the sounds um, for a piece of mining called Without Words. Uh, one reason I, would, I find this especially attractive is it 
brings to mind some theories of listening, in particular timbre, from a few decades ago, not, not recent theories by any means, um, but uh, David Wessel refers to the term timbre space, um, the idea that timbre seems to be, I think we can agree, not a single dimensional uh, parameter by any means, um, it seems that it could be thought of in a kind of multi-dimensional multi spatial way, and some, some research suggests that listeners think of timbre that way. So there's a sort of direct analogy to MIR there. Um, so I'd like to play you a brief example from this piece, um, which began with a sampling session with the soprano of Ensemble Dalmiente, um, Amanda de Bird Bartlett. The piece is for soprano solo, 11 instruments, and electronics. And uh, in addition to an audio archive, the piece is based on a text archive or a text network. So I brought to my recording session with Amanda a database of texts that I collected over a period of time. I represented them here with Wordle just for fun. I didn't present them to her like that. Um, but uh, the texts group around, they come from many authors, but they group around concepts of reproduction, uh, metaphor, reference. Um, and they're integrated so here's an example of her delivering one of the texts during our sampling session. Um, I also included the idea of vocal preparations, a bit like instrumental preparation. So she sings the text through different objects. <laughs> Instrumentalist of the ensemble, that's the bass player, uh, his bottom string detuned to the C below bass C, so an octave and a third lower, um, with aluminum foil for pre preparation on the string. Trace the gold sun about the whitened sky, without invasion by a single metaphor. I've also integrated some archival recordings there as well as Stevens reading his own line of poetry. Um, and I did some internet searches on the terms of some of my texts and came up with sound artifacts that way. Um, including, this is a sonorization of solar radio data, um, so I pulled that off of the internet uh, a bit unexpectedly, but then integrated it into the work as well. Um, so here's a short passage in the piece where you'll hear all of those elements together. <laughs> Of uh, 
field recordings, and we had brought some text, including some excerpts of Peleus and Melisa on the Debussy. And over the course of a week, as a group, the six of us put together a 30-minute chamber opera um, that included transcription, it included bits of Debussy, uh, it included instrumental transcriptions of environmental sounds, and it included the audience who was led around part of Aix-en-Provence uh, out in the city um, who had to find their way between different scenes of the opera. So in a way, uh, they actually were constructing the story along with us. So um, I hope you'll have a chance to take a look at some of those things on my website and other places. Um, thank you very much. suggest that that is what most music is. Um, I think there's a, I didn't cite Johannes Kreibler, he's another composer I'm sure we can into this group, but um, he has a nice line about every time you play an F on the piano, it's a citation from every F that's ever been played. We can think of other people who have said things a bit like that. So maybe through creating collages, I'd also like people to become more aware of the fact that any art that they're processing has some collage uh, as, as part of its genesis. But as a reflection of you as the composer specifically? Well, it definitely speaks to who I think I am. Um, I, I feel myself more of an observer sometimes than a generator of, of material. I like to show people what I find fascinating and uh, intricate and beautiful in the world around me. Um, I'm not sure that I uh, am so interested in sitting at a desk and pulling, pulling that out of nowhere as much as, as finding it around me and, and presenting it to others. I suppose what, what I find interesting, the, the particular aspect of your work that I find interesting is the, what, the transcriptions you end up with, you know, how the music information actually makes it into music, and um, these are highly diverse sources which are now connected as music. It's, you know, it's kind of like a microprocess that mm. more composition than you're Well, what, one thing that I didn't get into much in this talk, but I think it's a really rich topic, is to what extent what I'm describing is, in the end, original and creative, as much as one might begin by <coughs> denying that or contradicting it. Um, so I think you know every decision that I make and that all of the artists I cited make are very personal, creative, subjective decisions, and their personalities are intensely present in what they do. So I, I don't think that just because material comes from other sources means that one's artistic, artistic identity is not also very much there. So a very interesting talk, I like the uncreative <laughs> aspect of it. I, my question uh, goes to the point where you write this down. What is the purpose or the, the benefit of, of fixing it again? So you take a lot of floating and, and ephemeral material and then you fixate it or fix it on, on, a, on a surface. Uh, what is the intention? Well, the, of course, we, we know maybe some pieces that do similar things without notation. Um, I, at some point, realized in a concert with my own work, a performance of um, Alza Pavel Lucia piece uh, where the, instruct, where the um, performers are instructed to listen to natural sounds and then reproduce them through improvisation. Um, so, of course, it's possible to work that way, too. Um, I guess that I find that uh, I take a lot of pleasure in the detail that I can put into a score 
through very painstaking transcription and that then a really excellent performer can get back out again. And I know that there are improvisers who also can produce that level of detail. But for example, um, maybe it wasn't so apparent in the excerpt that I played, but there are other parts of that piece where the 11 player ensemble together realizes a transcription of a single field recording, um, which I think would be extremely difficult for them to realize in the same way um, without notation. So it's true that in the solo cases, maybe there is a very, well, in the end, productive overlap with non-notated practice, but I think you can do some things with uncreated composition to score of uh, large groups of performers that uh, can't really be done any other way. Well, my question is more of the dramaturgical aspect of it. Yeah. Is, it, is, it <laughs> is there a benefit to, to it being a written dramaturgy or a kind of composed sequence? Or could this, is the sequence in itself, um, uh, well, is it as open as a hypertext textual database? Well, e e e every piece that, that I've cited today is listened to more or less from beginning to end in a very organized form. So in the case of, of uh, the ensemble piece, I composed that form very carefully and in, a, in the end, very traditional way. In the case of the um, chamber opera, that form was composed collectively, but it was no less intentional. Um, so we as a group devised a half hour form that we again felt very strongly about that we wanted to lead the listener through, even though the listener had a bit of freedom exactly how they followed it. Um, so I, at least the work that I've shown, um, that formal dimension is important to me. I'm sure we could think of other, other ways to work where the form would be more open. Um, I'd definitely be interested in that. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.